This show contains movie spoilers and swearing. Welcome back to another episode of Bite Size Cinema. I'm your host, RJ McCready, and for this episode, I'm going to be taking you back to 1987 to take a look at Sam Raimi's and Bruce Campbell's cult classic horror movie, The Evil Dead 2. And joining me today for the show for the first time, it's been a long time coming, is Mark Ball. Mark, how you doing, buddy? Hey, RJ, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on, dude. You, you've got a really great show. I am notoriously bad at listening to other people's podcasts just because like basically all of my online friends are like podcasters or have been at some point so yeah i, I finally got to listen to got to listen to a few episodes of your show i was i was uh, driving around for work like a couple weeks ago i'm like holy shit rj's got a really good show he's got a great voice like i, I got me got me pumped to come on for this one man so yeah thanks for having me plus we're talking about one of my absolute favorite movies of all time so that that makes my work super easy yeah, I remember saying to you, I said, oh, do you want to come on the bite size? And uh, he said, oh, what movie? And I said, oh, uh, Evil Dead 2. And he's like, yeah, take my money. <laughs> so, <you laughs> exactly. Know, I dangled that carrot in front of you. But um, yeah, no, thanks for that. Thanks for your, your feedback there for the show. I think it's um, bite size has kind of formed into more of a sort of chat show now. So I'm getting you guys from Legion to come on. And it's, uh, it, it's a lot of fun. You know, it's, uh, it's it's been a good time, and I've, I've I've I started off as a listener, and formed into a podcast, and I'm I'm having a whole ton of fun. That's that's a lot. That's I mean, that's basically everybody. I think everybody at some point listens to another show, and are like, man, this is really cool. I kind of want to try this out. Like, I mean, that's how I got on board with the the, the deviants over on the Midnight Horror Show. I was like, I'm going to start my own show. And, my first show was absolute garbage, and I'm glad that it's like deleted off the internet for the most part. But you, you just you just keep going, you know. You get you get practice, and you you do more shows. And uh, I, I highly encourage people if they want to get into this, like ask ask one of your favorite podcasters if you can come on for a guest spot or something. It's like really good practice. I, I love doing guest spots because all I have to do is watch the movies and show up and talk about them. And then my responsibility, like aside from you know sharing it online and getting other people to listen to it or whatever and that's about the extent of it like you you've got the hard job of editing and hosting and uh getting it online and promoting it and stuff that that's the really difficult part about doing yeah. a podcast so uh guest spots are great man i've done uh a whole bunch of them the last two months i kind of put the put the feelers out online and was like yo uh, i'm kind of bored uh then you know nothing's going on because everything's still shut down kind of if you want me on your show hit me up and uh yeah thankfully you were one of the people that was like dude come on bite size i'm like absolutely yeah that's no, it's good man like i say yeah when i started out um podcast and i felt like tony stark in his cave and i kind of had that sort of mark one suit to start start with right. and like you said i listened back and i thought jesus <laughs> that, don't sound, that don't sound too great. <laughs> that's, that's everybody. everybody yeah, that's what, another thing. That's another thing I'll tell people is the, your your first couple of shows are always going to be rough, and then mm. definitely getting used to hearing your own voice and being able to go back and edit that like that takes some getting used to for sure. So uh, yeah, if if you're out there and you want to start a podcast, do it like and just you know just know that your first couple episodes are going to be a little rough. You gotta. You gotta get practice. You gotta keep going, kind of. It's like anything else. Yeah, and more importantly, what I say to people is just to talk about something that you really enjoy, which is the start of the ten. Because most of the time, well, really, this these podcasts now for me is I love talking about films. I know you love talking about films, so it's basically talking about films with a microphone. And if anybody else wants to jump in and have a listen to us, you know, <laughs> feel free, man. Exactly. You know, so. yeah. Yep. <laughs> but um. Talking about other podcasts, so Mark, I know you do, uh, is it Doing the Nasty with uh, Duncan McLeish? I know that's a, a regular one of yours. Yeah, that's that's about my only regular one right now. I mean, that uh, we do once a month, uh, the show's called Doing the Nasty. This is season two. Uh, there are 
So basically what the show is about, there there are three lists of movies uh, from the UK in the 80s, like when VHS was st- first starting to become a big thing. Uh, these are the, the banned movies. These, these are the movies that the UK censors decided were either just way too intense for, you know, UK audiences to watch or they, you know, sent them through with heavy, heavy cuts. Uh Actually, Evil Evil Dead 1 is, like, a pretty notorious one. I think that's on, like, the higher tier list yeah. where the UK was just like, nope, this is outright banned. And it was for a pretty long time. Uh, I actually saw the BBFC, the British Board of Film Classification, tweeting about Evil Dead, like, a couple weeks ago. And they were like, oh, this movie's had a really interesting history as far as our <laughs> classification goes. But now that it's not banned... We can talk about it, and you can see it and stuff. And Bruce Campbell came back and retweeted that post and was like, yeah, you guys just like, uh, you know, (laughs) this is a pretty, the first one is a pretty tame movie compared to some of the other stuff on the list. And uh, yeah, Bruce Campbell was having none of that shit. And it's just like, you guys were just like absolute Nazis about this back in the day. And it actually helped us because, it, you know, people traded bootleg tapes of the thing around so much that it got like a little bit of notoriety. And when it finally did come out on video in the UK, it was like number one on the charts for like a really long time. So, uh, yeah, that's 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 kind of the the gist of doing the nasty. We're we're going through Duncan and I are going through the tier three list, which are movies that were maybe not necessarily banned, but like I mean, I, this is like hard hard to imagine like nowadays. But like, yeah, back then. Police officers would like roam the video shops looking for banned movies to like either confiscate or you could be arrested for renting some of this stuff out. Like it's it's insane it's to crazy. think about in this day and age yeah. where the internet just has like any kind of awful shit that you're looking for. You can probably find it one way or another. But uh, yeah, they're real concerned with uh, VHS tapes of horror movies back then. So. Uh, yeah, we're going through the tier three list. So these are movies that like are maybe not necessarily fully banned, but could be confiscated for sure and burned. They burned tens of thousands of tapes, like in this whole this whole thing. And uh, yeah, the the man, it, it, it's it's wild going through this list because the uh, the quality of movies is all over the place. Like there's some. Uh, just absolute masterpieces on there. You got stuff like Suspiria and the original yep. Dawn of the Dead and uh, Shogun Assassin is one of my favorites that we did a little while ago. And then there's just like pure garbage on this list that like I think the censors probably made it like five minutes into it and there was something that offended them. Or they just looked at the box art and were like, nope, that's a, you got a woman being strangled on the box or something. So that's an automatic like confiscation kind of deal Absolutely. and uh yeah going going through them has been really interesting because it's just it's it's something new every month basically yeah. like and you know so some the the, the we duncan plugged it all the movies into like a randomizer basically so we're not doing them in any sort of order except for what the computer decided and so some months we get like you know two really great movies like we did dawn of the dead and shogun assassin on the same show and then we'll go like months and it'll just be two just absolute pieces of dog shit over and over again for like months before we get to another good movie so uh yeah D- duncan i think knew that i'm a it's hard to say i'm a fan of like bad cinema like i i i, I definitely delve into that a lot and i think uh growing up on stuff like mystery science theater and like ed wood movies and a lot of the stuff from like the like the drive-in era of cinema basically like a lot of stuff that like my mom was kind of like oh well this is kind of what i grew up on me you should check this out maybe you'll like it like i think that has added to uh duncan basically knew that i was like kind of into bad movies yeah. so like even, even yeah even like the worst stuff on the the video nasty list i, I still really enjoy talking about and i, I think you know, I, I don't subscribe to the idea that, like, oh, making movies is really hard, so if a movie's bad, you shouldn't, like, talk bad about it, or if you have nothing nice to say about a bad movie, don't say anything at all. Nah, dude, it's it's a lot of fun talking about bad movies and why they're bad and why they don't work and how <laughs> painful they are to sit through sometimes. I think that's, you know, this is, some people like Glenn Danzig set out to make really bad movies, so, I mean, uh, <laughs> it's like... <laughs> 
you know, y you should give them some kind of attention or, you know, they're, they're, there's a lot of weirdos like me out there that deeply enjoy sitting through, like, just the, the worst movies possible, you know. No, so. not at all. I mean, um, I think it's just somebody's art at the end of the day, isn't it? Somebody's managed to put this together and knowing a couple of independent filmmakers myself, how difficult it is to actually try and put something together. Uh, so yeah. I guess I have an appreciation for it from that sort of angle. And the other thing is, I mean, some of the, you might find a gem every now and again. And uh, like what you're saying with the video nasty market, because it was put to one side, it's kind of created a new market today for things like uh, Arrow Video, say, you know, which I think Duncan McLeish has got some sort of share in, if you know what I mean, because he's always <laughs> sort of posting something on there, you know, like, and I'm just, uh, I'm just surprised or it, 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 it it amazes me just how many films I haven't seen, if you know what I mean. I just, you know, if I look on social media and someone's going, hey, I found this film. And I'm like, well, how have I never heard of that? It's come out in the 80s, but it's that film that got put aside because of the video nasty era. So it's kind yeah. of created a market for today. But yeah, you know, it's, it's fun. Um, and like I say, every now and again, you find a gem. But I think sometimes you find something that you you like which no one else is going to like but you know that's fine if it does it for you you know it's, it's, it's yeah uh, it's I, have, I have really system. weird taste in movies and so, sometimes a movie just hits you a certain way depending on like what kind of mood you're in or whatever i i think probably my favorite discovery so far from this tier three list was a movie called massacre mafia style <laughs> which is this really really supremely goofy uh gangster movie from the 70s that this dude with like uh, no money whatsoever. He was like a, a Las Vegas entertainer, basically, and he, you know, he he was buds with like Sinatra's son, and like knew knew a lot of people that could kind of that had connections that like mm. made it so it wasn't very hard for him to make a movie. But he he aimed for the sky, like right out the gate, his first movie. He's like, I want to make a movie that's like The Godfather, only way better, and that's Massacre Mafia style, and it's. <laughs> definitely not better than the godfather it's you know it's it's the the cheapo version of the godfather <laughs> but what he was lacking in you know uh talent and foresight and resources he made up for with just like sheer nastiness because it's, it's a nasty little movie Jeez. it's incredibly it's incredibly violent and yeah just full of like all kinds of insane shit and it's like uh, it, it was such a joy to discover this movie <laughs> that I had never even heard of, like prior to doing the doing the show on it. And uh, yeah, that, that I think has probably been one of my favorite new discoveries. And of course, there's a gorgeous re restored version of that from Grindhouse uh, releasing. Uh, I, I definitely picked up the Blu-ray of that one because I'm like, this is uh, definitely going to come back into circulation. Like you know, anytime I have like a uh, like a bad movie night with friends or something. That's definitely a <laughs> drink beer and of laugh course. your ass off kind of movie. Yeah, that's what they're there for, these films, aren't they? To be watched with an audience of friends, just the law of that. Um, yep. But talking about video nasties, and I think we, we're going to be talking about uh, one of the king of the video nasties today, um, certainly from what I remember when I was a kid, but I'll get into that in a minute. Um, shall we, what we do Mark, is we'll, we'll go into that cabin in the woods, we'll get the chainsaw, we'll go and carve ourselves a witch mate, and um, we'll play a trailer, and we will come back soon. There's something out there, it lives out in those woods, in the dark, something that's come back from the dead. this 
And welcome back guys, so the synopsis to this film, it's a fairly long synopsis, the lone survivor of an onslaught of flesh possessing spirits holds up in the cabin with a group of strangers while the demons continue their attack. It's a horror comedy, it was an R rated movie, I think that's changed now, 7.7 uh, .7 on IMBD and it's got a 124 minute runtime. Um, so Mark, we've already spoken a lot about Video Nasties, this film, when did you first see The Evil Dead 2? So, I, I was probably like about 13 or 14. Yeah. Uh, I actually remember seeing Army of Darkness first. I did these in kind of backwards order, like yeah. as far as the original trilogy of these go. I remember being really young when we very first got satellite TV mm -hmm. at my house, because my parents lived out in the country, so we couldn't really get like cable TV or anything. And I was definitely too young to be renting this type of stuff from our, our local video shop. Like, I, I, like by the time I came around, they were kind of uh, enforcing that a little bit more, I think, at the, at the local video mm -hmm. shops. Uh, but I saw Army of Darkness on, like, the Encore channel when I was, like, really young. My, my older sister was big into watching stuff that she probably shouldn't have been and in turn would show me stuff that I probably shouldn't have been watching at that age and... Uh, yeah, Army of Darkness was an early one, and I remember like the uh, like the thing in the pit at the beginning, uh, yeah. like the pit witch basically like kind of freaked me out, mm -hmm. and then like the actual like the the witch that flies around and stuff kind of freaked me out. I, I was probably like nine or ten or something, I think, when I first saw most of that, and then like years years later, I I started like seeing like people started talking a lot more about the evil dead movies like I, I would see it in like wizard magazine and uh, uh another one was toy fair because i'm big into action figures i remember them talking about it a lot and eventually yeah and like i i started getting really into horror like at about like 12 or 13 and uh evil dead was definitely one that was like big on a lot of people's lists so i, I don't know why i didn't go back to the first one first i think it was probably kind of just a thing where uh, people spoke way more highly about Evil Dead Two than any of the other, uh, the the other two movies in the trilogy. I think yeah. so. Uh, yeah, at some point I got my hands on like a VHS copy of Evil Dead Two, and I I just instantly fell in love with it. It's like such an incredible mix of uh, goofy slapstick comedy and just like balls to the wall, just like comedic levels of gore in this movie. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I just, I, I, I fell in love instantly and it was a, all, all three of the movies really, but particularly Evil Dead 1 and 2 were huge influences on me wanting to be a filmmaker in my teenage years because they're still like, I mean, they're still ostensibly like low budget movies, especially the first one I think was made for like, I don't know, 40, 50 grand or something yeah. back in 1981, like a my, micro budget kind of film. They had a little bit more at their disposal when Evil Dead 2 came out. But yeah, I was like right from the get-go, like really obsessed with low budget horror movies because I was like, I could do this. Like this is, this doesn't look that hard. Like, <laughs> <laughs> which of, of course, yeah, even you read the, uh, at some point I picked up the Evil Dead Companion, like the book that goes along with these. And there's some incredible stories about making the first Evil Dead. Uh, also in uh, Br Bruce Campbell wrote a couple books in the last like 10 years here. Or so yeah. there's, his first one, there are some incredible stories about making the first Evil Dead and what an absolute shit show that was. Um, Evil Dead 2 is also one of the first DVDs I ever owned. I remember getting it out of the, uh, I don't think it was Columbia House, but it was who, whoever was doing like the uh, uh, buy 12 DVDs for a penny <laughs> and then in small print, if you buy like six more at $40 a piece yeah. or something, so... I remember the the Anchor Bay. That was it. Uh, yeah, yeah that's one I got. Yeah, you you also had that one. Yeah, I've got the Anchor Bay one. I've got it on. Um, I've got all three movies um, on a nice package with all the artwork on it. I think it's one of the first ones with extras that came out in the nineties. Um, yeah. But yeah, which my... was a big big deal, man. Like the audio commentaries, like I was fascinated yeah. listening to them talking about how they did everything in this movie because there's so much goofy shit and like it's a very much an you know 
everything and the kitchen sink like method of filmmaking like basically every kind of special effect you can think of is at some point used in evil dead 2 so <laughs> yeah i was big time obsessed with the audio commentary track on that dvd yeah i was the same though i um i saw army of darkness first um as a trailer on tv but then um, my my first um, the first time that Evil Dead Two came into my life was through my dad because um, he was a video engineer during the eighties. And do you remember the Betamax? <laughs> oh yeah, we we didn't have one. That was a little little bit before my time, but I think yeah. one of our neighbors did, and I was fascinated by those little tiny baby tapes. I was like, what the hell yeah, is this? Well, I, I put one of those baby tapes into the player, thinking it was actually Buck Rogers. Um, and I've hit play, and all of a sudden, you know, the way the Evil Dead starts off, or the Evil Dead 2 starts off with the Necronomicon, and I was like, eight years old, and I was like, holy <laughs> shit, man, I've just opened up the portal to hell, you know what I mean? And I was like, Fuck. and I quickly turned it off, and I thought, what? I, I, I thought, let's not do that again. Um, <laughs> and then, this was a time for so this was a time in the sort of early 90s or late 80s early 90s where you didn't have any social media and i'll shout dan bone out here from podcast and he always mentioned this on the show where you used to have playground talk you know where you was kids in the playground and one kid came in and said hey there's this film i watched with this guy with a chainsaw in a cabin and uh it sounded great and so the Evil Dead was sort of coming out in little bits, you know. I saw posters in the video in the video shop, you know, the VHS store, which we've already mentioned. And so this film was kind of being drip fed to me. And then uh, 1991 was it? I think he, uh, Army of Darkness came out, and I saw that as a trader on TV, and I thought, oh my god, there's that film. That is it, you know, this guy with a chainsaw, you know, there's a cool poster, isn't it, of Bruce Campbell looking up into the air with the gun, and I just thought, wow, that looks amazing. Um, so I watched that first, and I was blown away by it, and then I went back to go and revisit the other two movies. So what's strange with The Evil Dead 2 is it's, it is such a cult movie, I think, but... Uh, it doesn't hold too much nostalgia for me because I didn't watch it when I was younger. You know, right. that like Ghostbusters or Back to the Future. It's something I actually watched in my teens, but still, you know, <laughs> it's a film I go back to and I'm like, yeah, this is cool. This is because I, I feel like I'm, as I said earlier, I appreciate the the way the film has been put together with, you know, as you said, they, they've chucked everything into it. Uh, brooms, gaffer tape, everything <laughs> to, to put this film together. Uh. Yeah, it had been it had been like a year or two, I think, since I'd, I I've probably seen Evil Dead Two like over a hundred times at this point, just because I played it so many times in my mm. teen years. But it, it had been uh, a couple years since I watched it. I just watched this yesterday. I threw it on in the morning and yeah. uh, went through it, and it's. Oh, man, it's it's still such a great movie. Like I, I, some of the things I kind of noticed on this rewatch, uh, a lot of it really reminds. Like it's it it became really apparent why Sam Raimi got the Spider Man movies like from the get go. Because I was watching Evil Dead Two, and I was like, so much of this reminds me of like a like splatter punk kind of like comic book basically. Yeah. Like I, I know they they talk about it on the bonus features a little bit. Sam Raimi is a horrendous, like, he cannot draw to save his life. And they, like, show some of his, like, comically bad uh, storyboards yeah. that he did for this. But, like, you would never be able to tell that just based on watching the film, I think. Because everything is, like, framed and shot and edited, like, so, like, precisely and meticulously that it looks like this, this go around here reminded me of just, like, a... It, it seemed like something that would have been like just straight adapted from like a graphic novel, basically, uh, which I, I thought was kind of interesting. Like I'd never really looked at it like that before. But Sam Raimi is like a big comic book fan, like especially like you know he's he's talked about how getting the Spider Man gig was kind of like his dream job because yeah. he was big into comic books as a kid. And um, kind of the other thing that I, I realized on this go around was the the influence of Dino De Laurentiis who mm -hmm. was the producer on this. He's a big deal Italian producer. 
uh, like, you know, fun, funded and helped uh, filmmakers create hundreds and hundreds of movies. And a lot of them were Italian movies. And like, that was something that, yeah, kind of occurred to me watching this yesterday. I was like, there's a lot of this that reminds me of Fulci kind of like, especially the uh, like less goofy parts, like the stuff with like kind of the side characters and stuff and the, the plot about, uh, you know, Professor Nobi in the cabin and stuff. Yeah. And yeah. it had, it had a very like, uh, I don't know, like an epic Italian movie kind of feel to it. There's just like, you know, the way, ways that things are lit, ways that things are shot, the dubbing, like, there's a lot of voiceover, mm -hmm. like, redubs in this movie, and some of them are kind of wonky, but I, I think it kind of just adds the charm to it. Like, you know, like I said, it reminded me of a lot of, like, just, like, uh, trashy Italian movies, basically. <laughs> and uh, I, 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 I'd never, yeah, like, uh, Fulci and Italian cinema came quite a bit later in my my movie going life i guess you could say so uh that, that was kind of an interesting thing that i noticed like coming back to it this go around i was yeah. like wow a lot of this re reminds me of fulci i do get that though when you, especially when you talk about the other characters such as sarah berry dan hicks and cassie wesley playing uh, bobby joe uh annie and jake and you get the scene with the airplane that comes in don't you so you can see there's a little bit of a bigger budget here where it come, goes away from the cabin and like you say, you've got that backstory. Yeah. And then you kind of got Bruce Campbell being this kind of superhero, I guess, in the end. Do you know what I mean? He is kind of like a standout character. He kind of brings, it, brings his own into it. He's a little bit more goofy in this one, I think. Um, and I think it is kind of like uh, uh, the origins of a superhero where he's gone he's been be beaten about by the demons and then by the third act he's basically gone you know fuck you demons this is it I'm, I'm gonna rise up to this now and it's like he's missing his hand so he gets the chainsaw and then he's got the shotgun and then he's got his humor and he, his one-liners and you just think this is the formation of a superhero um, in all this chaos and yeah. it, it, it's another thing that I like and I, I think um, I think Ash for me you know listening to all the other shows and especially all you guys on Legion and all our fellow uh, podcasters and friends on the page um, I think it's evident that Ash is the everyday guy so because he gets bad because he gets bruised because he's not um, he's a little bit goofy uh, he doesn't, he's way out of the head of his shit um, but he pulls through do you know what I mean and I think there's a little bit in, on all of us that kind of likes that do you know what I mean he's, and it's, things don't work out for him <laughs> and he's, he's just totally relatable um, yeah, and I think yeah, that's why yeah, he's a standout horror icon which we can relate to and I think that's why people like love this character a little bit you know it's, He's, he's got quite a few character arcs between the three movies. Like in Evil Dead 1, he's very much like... Uh, that, that That's like the wimpiest version of mm. Ashes like the, in the first one where, yeah, he's definitely like our, our everyman. But yeah. like if you didn't... If you didn't know better, you would almost think that like Scotty is kind of the main character of the first one. And then yeah. they pull a little bit of a switcheroo like between it. Uh, Ash in Evil Dead 2 definitely starts off as a humongous dork. Mm. Uh, one one thing that I had never like put a whole lot of thought into is that Ash can play the piano really well. <laughs> There's like <laughs> yeah. five five seconds of him playing the piano at mm. the beginning of Evil Dead too, and I never really like put a lot of thought into it. And I'm mm. like, he can't be that big of a doofus if he's like you know a fairly accomplished piano player, and he's like, uh, yeah, he's he, he's he's good with the ladies. Like at the beginning of Evil oh, Dead yeah. too, for sure. Linda Linda <laughs> is big big into into him and. Uh, yeah, it, it really kind of just he he gets thrown to the wolves very quickly in Evil Dead Two, whereas like there's a little bit more build up in the first one. In this one, uh, they kind of and this is like a, a point of contention I think between a lot of the fans of this movie. Is this a remake of the first movie uh -huh. or is this a sequel to the first movie? I, I've heard a lot yeah. of opinions on this. Well, um, I think this is a sequel. Now I've got to be careful what I say because I know Court Sarps listens to me show, um, so got to be careful not to piss that guy off because <laughs> uh, I, mean, I kind of think, uh, it's, I think it's both kind of it's um, like it has like a recap of the first movie in the beginning but then it right. like extends the story considerably so i had a look into this and i got a little bit confused because when I, if you watch this without 
paying too much of attention at the beginning and you're aware of the first movie, you, you kind of go, hang on a second, this is a, this is a remake with a bit of a bigger budget. But what's happened is the uh, first seven minutes is kind of like a rehash or a diluted rehash of number one. And Sam Raimi couldn't get the rights to his own movie for some reason to, to replay the footage from the original film. So right. he's done a quick rehash with just two characters being Bruce and his girlfriend Linda. And then from the seventh minute when Ash is in the woods is when it goes into sequel. So it just follows straight on from the first film. Right. If that kind Which, of makes yeah. sense. So um, from there onwards, you've got that's where it ties in with the first movie. Um, but the confusing thing is, is that in that seven minutes, you don't see any of the other characters. But I think that was probably just down to budget. Um, so it is. At, you just think Ash has always been in this cabin. cabin. Um, he's just following on. And then obviously these. Uh, what is it? The other characters then come into it with the book to uh, try and stop all this uh, demon mayhem. If that kind of makes sense. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's that's pretty much where mm. where I'm at with it. But I remember like seeing this for the first, or really, it was when I went back to watch the first movie after seeing this one, and I was like, "What the hell?" It's like almost yeah. the same. Like it's yeah. it's very very close, but yeah, like that's that's kind of where I've come around to it. Also, yeah. So the it's 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 kind of both. It's kind of a remake and it's kind of a sequel. Uh, it, it, it accomplishes both, but um, yeah, yeah. I, I like what you're saying. Yeah, about how Ash like be, really does become like this. This he gets put through the ringer in this mm. movie. Not just the character, but Bruce Campbell himself. Like that was, that was another thing I was kind of amazed to see this time. I was like, there's really not very many times in this movie where I'm like, that is clearly a stunt double and not Bruce Campbell. Like he really kind of just beats the shit out of himself like throughout this movie. And I gotta, I gotta respect the, uh, <laughs> the lengths that he went through. Like in, in, and that's why I think a, a lot of people, you know, remember this movie for is like uh, Bruce Campbell's great physical acting in this and his, willingness to just beat the hell out of himself for, for the part like it's not uh that's not the kind of commitment you get like from actors very often and definitely making something like this nowadays they'd want you to be like you can't like have the the lead of your movie like smashing plates over his head or mm-hmm. falling down flights of stairs like uh you gotta you got use stunt doubles for that type of shit that wasn't really a thing in 87 i mean it was but like i think these guys were just so used to doing everything themselves that Bruce Campbell was probably just like, yeah, I'll throw myself down a flight of stairs or, you know, smash plates and bottles over my head. No big deal. <laughs> yeah. And go back to what you said earlier, at the beginning of the film, you know, with Linda, where he just comes out and goes, you're a woman and I'm a man, baby. You know, should we get a bit, you know, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's like, it's definitely like Just a like a twelve year old's like idea of what romance would be like. Like that's, <laughs> I think yeah. that's, that's something in a lot of these earlier Sam Raimi movies is like he's definitely uh, you know that's uh, I, I don't want to say like a twelve year old is like your target audience, but like it's just made with that in mind, kind of like I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but. Yeah, I, I, I think um, I think the other thing with Ash is he is an archetypical type character in the horror genre at this time as well, and it's evident that people, other film directors, have looked at this character and thought, let's do this the same, especially with someone like Edgar Wright with Shaun of the Dead. Um, so you've got the, the Shaun character in that movie who is kind of similar to Ash, where he's sort of he's evading responsibilities but then in the end he goes all full on responsible and gets the gets the cricket bat and gun and basically kicks the ass out of everything because he's basically been battered and bruised by all these zombies and that and yeah you kind of sort of see the similar it's basically I, I i see this as a bit of a blueprint in the horror genre where people have gone let's try and let's do an evil dead film but let's do it with a different spin or um, so it certainly put its place in the horror market, I think, this film. So okay. I'll, I'll just leave it from. So yeah, this film, um, there's certainly a lot of other films that I I would say that have been inspired by it. Certainly uh, uh, Peter Jackson's Brain Braindead. Uh, I think there's a, there's, that's taken a lot from this film. 
Yeah, definitely. In terms of gore, for sure, uh, Peter Jackson, man, I wish he'd go back to making movies like that. They were just like, <laughs> yeah. at the time, at the time, Dead Alive had, uh, I think, the world record for the, the most amount of uh, fake blood used <laughs> in a movie, which uh, Evil Dead 2, I'm sure, was probably in in pretty strict uh, competition with that, <laughs> as far as that goes. I wonder, how, um, I wonder how many people have John. oh, it's Peter Jackson, the guy that brought us The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, you know, and people have got in and gone, oh yeah, let's, let's go and watch uh, Brain Dead or Bad Taste, that's, that's going to be a good film, and they've like, put it on and sat around there with their families and they go, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, hopefully someday before Peter Jackson hangs it up, we get, we get another movie like that, but uh, we'll see how it goes. I would honestly just be happy if he put uh, if he just restored uh, Brain Dead and Bad Taste in some of those earlier movies and put them out on Blu-rays, but uh, that, that that's a different show, kind of. Uh, yeah, uh, other movies. I'm trying to think of some other movies that were hugely inspired by this. Uh, there, there, there's some g- pretty great movie from the early 2000s called Dead and Breakfast. Yeah, that's about kind of the same thing. I think like a bunch of people show up to a town and they get kind of like either possessed or turned into zombies. And there's a great uh, big chainsaw fight it, 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 toward, towards the end of that one. Um, it, it, we see the the uh, the like the, the parts in Evil Dead Two where Ash is assembling like his his chainsaw hand towards the end, and we get those like great. Uh, it, it's basically like a montage kind of. It's, it's just a lot of like quick cuts of yeah uh, him, him assembling the chainsaw. That that I see in movies all the time. I mean, I think. A great another you know shot of the deads and that's another thing they kind of borrowed from that you get the uh uh the various shots of him doing very mundane things but it's shot the same way as it is in evil dead 2 where it's a lot of just like crash zoom zooms and quick edits and like it makes it seem like really exciting okay. and uh, you know in, in shot of the dead he's just like making toast or whatever kind of deal i always laugh when that yeah, that, that the um, on there. the Cornetto, isn't it? I think now you mention it with the montage, it is he goes into the shop, didn't you? See the till open up, get some money out, exchanged, and then he gives him the Cornetto, doesn't he? And stuff like that, or goes down the Winchester and pours a pint, pint, and it's done in a sort of Evil Dead type montage, isn't it? So I guess there is that little spin on that, um, which is kind of cool. Ah. Uh. And yeah, yeah, just in general, a lot of the uh, you know uh, we're go- we're going out. We we know somebody that's got a cabin, so let's film a horror movie there. There's been lot lots and lots of those pop up on the the video nasty list. I, I think it's just a you know a, a low but a low budget filmmaking technique, or you know just basically being able to use what you have at your disposal. Like I, I think a lot of people know somebody that's got a creaky old cabin that they could go shoot a horror movie in, basically. So. Yeah, uh, lo- lots and lots of those. There was another thing for me as well, where uh, when I was growing up, we used to tell each other ghost stories, and we used to talk about haunted houses and stuff like that. Or if something scared me, I'd go, "Oh shit!" But then after watching The Evil Dead, I think because I saw Ash deal with this, it kind of made me feel a bit better. If that kind of makes sense to think, "Oh, how would Ash deal with this situation?" Do you know what I mean? And how would he go about dealing with it? So I suppose he's kind of like the um, remedy to a problem, if that makes sense. And in this case, it's like the demon problem. He is basically the pain in the ass for them to sort of turn it on its table, isn't it? Um, or whether the demon's just kind of reddish toying with this guy, you know? Uh, there's that I thought about as well. There's little bit, There's little bits of depth to this movie where I think there's some clever writing here as much as it is a is a goofy movie i think that sam raimi is kind of throwing us some good stories there you know in this with some uh, horror forms and stuff like that yeah definitely yeah it's like <laughs> on, <laughs> you know I mean? on, on paper the movie sounds like incredibly goofy and like i could kind of understand why somebody would be like that's not something i want to see but like yeah when, once you it kind of, you know, unfolds and like, uh, <laughs> you, you kind of get what they're going for, which, yeah, like I, I figured out early on that like this was hugely inspired by the Three Stooges oh, and yeah. like the Sam Raimi and those dudes were huge, huge Stooge fans and they were just like, 
uh, that, that's another thing that like in the, the handful of smaller video projects that I've worked on, if you can't do something adequately, like deadly seriously, a good way to remedy that kind of is to inject as much humor into it as possible as kind of a way of telling the audience, like, you know, it's, it's just a movie. It's, it's not meant to be taken deadly seriously. And you know, if you, you know, like I said, if you, if you can't do it super seriously, do it kind of goofy and your audience will usually give you a pass. And, you know, if, if things are a little, you know, your sets, your actors, if everything production wise is a little bit lackluster because you're, you know, a, a noob at this and don't have a lot at your disposal. Like I think the audience will forgive you for a lot of things. If you can make them laugh. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and the other thing here is uh, obviously the special effects in this film. Um, it's obviously got a little bit, of, it's got a lot more of a bigger, bigger budget than the 40 grand that they had in the first movie, which they did a good job with. But it's evident that they got, got a bigger, bigger budget here, which I think is three and a half million dollars. Um, from which you said the Dino De Dino Rentis, um company. I think they had to call it a Rosebud company, didn't they? Because they don't. I, don't think uh, the distributors wanted to put their stamp on it because it was a horror movie, but they got over that. Um, but the scene I remember talking about the most when I was in my teens was the actual Henrietta monster in the uh, oh, fruit yeah. cellar, you know, and it, it used to go, Somebody's in my fruit cellar, mm, like that. Do you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> Oh dear, the amount of times we used to recite that, you know, growing up, it was like, oh, it's amazing. I, I do, I do love that they refer to her, like, like I, I think you referenced her early in this recording as the the witch in the cellar. Yeah. Like, just, just saying that, like, conjures just such a you know kind of timeless image in my head. Uh, you, know, you know, like, like you said, telling telling scary stories, like as kids or whatever like you know as as ludicrous as it sounds to an adult like witches like i, I think i grew up thinking witches were going to be more of a problem in my life than they actually ended up becoming so uh and and henrietta is not really a witch i mean she's an old old lady uh that's been possessed by the the dark forces of the book or whatever uh, but like, yeah, she, 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 like the, the way she acts. And I, th I also think it's really interesting that she's played by Ted Raimi, yeah. who I'm sure just like, you know, channeled a lifetime of being told, you know, fairy tales and stuff about witches and stuff. And, uh, just, just kind of took that and ran with it. And, uh, it, it's such a great performance, especially knowing that he's under, uh, like however many pounds of latex and, uh, they shot this in the deep south, I forget which state, uh, in the middle of summer, so it is ungodly hot on this on the cabin set, and poor Ted Raimi is just covered in latex and has to act through all of this stuff, and <laughs> there's the great shot of when he's like kind of flying around the cabin, and he turns to uh, Ash at some point and just like screams at him. And if you look real carefully, you can see sweat pouring out of the ear of the costume. Oh, wow. And uh, uh -huh. it's, it's super gross. Uh, yeah, just one, one of those things. It's like, man, that that dude. Bruce Campbell got it pretty bad on this shoe, but I think Ted Raimi probably worked the hardest on this thing. And, like, basically, like, I, I, how, how they didn't kill the poor guy shooting this, like, in the the deep south in the middle of the summer, like under all that latex and stuff, I don't know. But uh, yeah, Henrietta is just like such a cool design of a character. And well, yeah, they, 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 they bust out some stop motion, which yeah, I'm sure, you know, I'm big, big into stop motion for uh, the, the head transformation. And yeah, it's, it's, it's really like every, every single trick that they could come up with, for this movie they they ended up using like to in some respect one one thing i like really appreciated seeing this now because i don't know if i'd ever seen this on like a a proper hd like tv I, I i watched this a million times as a teenager but it was on a vhs on like a crappy little crt tv in my bedroom yeah, so this yeah, was yeah. like maybe i've only seen this like maybe a handful of times 
on like a proper Blu-ray on a proper size TV. And the miniature work on this is like another thing that like I really noticed a lot this time. I'm like, man, they had some really incredible artists working on this that did, you know, uh, matte painting composites when like you need something crazy in the background, but then you'd also build like, you know, a miniature of the cabin or whatever. Uh, definitely the, the shot where uh, Ash comes to the bridge that's been destroyed and it's all bent. The bridge itself is like bent all up to kind of look like a pair of hands on either side of the cliff. Uh, that was like somebody spent an incredible amount of time doing that matte painting miniature combination on that. And it goes by in like a couple seconds. Like some, some dude probably spent an insane amount of time on that. And it's only only on screen for like a couple seconds. But like I really appreciate like the amount of work that goes into that type of stuff and like it just you know that's how you had to do it back in the day there were there was no computer effects so every single uh either practical or kind of in-camera trick that you could do it it comes out at some point in this movie and yeah the the miniatures i think were a big thing that i noticed on this watch around yeah absolutely um i, I did think of that because the- we always say this, you know, when you when you do a review on the movie, you have a little bit more of a critical eye and you look at stuff. And um, the other thing that I love is the actual third act to this, well, the end third act to this, uh, final act of the movie, where you've got the vortex that turns up as well, and you've got flings flying around the room, and you've then got Ash coming out, and coming out with those great lines, he's like, how do you stop it, you know, and he's like flying <laughs> through the air, you know. And uh, he's got his old mobile car that goes through the vortex, and I just thought it's just a great scene. And um, I think that's the other thing. This film, you have um, you have an appreciation for the the making of the movie with, like you say, the special effects crew um, and the actors, because it is a uh, it's, it's made on a budget, isn't it? And like you say, the the attention to detail, like you say, with the bridge and the uh, stop animation. Which is, like I say, an awful lot of time that's gone into that. But then it really is kind of like a blink and you miss, isn't it? Um, yeah. But, yeah, I, I don't know. I think with The Evil Dead, I think uh, I think the time that it came out, the video nasty theme that it's got attached to it, and even the, the poster art, I think it's just iconic, you know, that it, like, for me, I'm, I'm, a, I'm all about the poster art. Uh, even if the film's rubbish, <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's got yeah. good many, poster many on, movies man. I've yeah. watched so, solely based on the on the box <laughs> art. I'm like, that's got a cool box. I'm still a sucker for that too. Yeah. And the uh, the the video labels, like you know your arrows and your vinegar syndromes and people like that, they they know full well that like people like us are suckers. If you got a real good box, like that, you know, I've blind bought many, many movies based solely on that's got a cool cover that i watch it i'm like that's a dog shit movie but it's got a cool cover <laughs> yeah that's it yeah exactly that it doesn't matter it's fine it's okay it's gonna go nicely up on the shelf because it looks cool um <laughs> yeah I, I, yeah i just um i know i keep saying this i can still i can still smell the um the cigarettes in, in the VHS store when I look at this cover because um, it was a regular on the shelf even before I saw it because as I said at the beginning of the show Evil Dead was kind of just being drip fed to me I, I either saw it on a trailer or I saw it in the VHS store and I looked up and I thought well there's that film the guy with the chainsaw you know and it, it, it it's probably going to scare me or something like that so there's always that sort of curiosity but um I can still smell that video store, you know, the smoke and the plastic, and the, and it's it's kind of like a sort of magical thing as well. So I, I guess that holds nostalgia for me. Uh, yeah. The Evil Dead, and I think I hear a lot of people say that as well. You know, it's it's whether you like the Evil Dead or not, it's it's just it's on that sort of pedestal, isn't it? You know, the the, the horror genre. I, I think this was a lot of people's like early like this is like uh, one of those movies that you check out when you're first getting into horror. Like for for me, uh, George Romero's Living Dead movies mm. were like I was big into like zombies were kind of my uh, gateway into horror. Uh, like I, I was playing like that, that was also around the time that like the uh, 
the Resident Evil video games were coming out, like the the first bunch of those. So I got really big into zombies, and my mom at some point bought me a VHS copy of Night of the Living Dead, and that I think was like the the catalyst, to like where I was like, oh my god, I I, I just immediately fell in love with horror movies, and uh, yeah, Evil Dead was not too far after that, just because it had such. Uh, notoriety and a lot of you know I, I barely have ever known anybody that doesn't like the Evil Dead movies if they're big into horror there are a couple for some reason Jamie J. Sammons hates Evil Dead too because of the humor which I don't understand at all yeah. but for, by by and large I think you know a lot of people this is kind of one of their earlier horror movies that they go to and you know it, it holds kind of a special place in their heart because you know kind of help kickstart their love of the genre so yeah this is a i I, i'm glad you invited me on for this because this is a extremely i think important uh movie and the the the, all the the rest of them too i think are you know really important to the genre and are kind of kind of a big deal amongst horror fans (laughs) yeah um well i think we've shown a lot of love for this film we've gone through a lot of things uh the other thing i was going to quickly mention before uh, the end of this show was also the uh, uh, the Evil Dead TV show, uh, yeah. which, which I I enjoyed, um, particularly the first season. I thought there were some really good uh, moments, and it was good to see Ash um, back on the screen again. You know, being Ash, and it's interesting to see how he is. Um, I was going to say in the real world, um, because I guess in this is the other thing with these films. It is almost like um, Ash Williams has jumped through a rabbit hole going into either the cabin in the first movie or the cabin in the second movie or then going through into the vortex where he goes back to the medieval times. And I think really with the um, Ash versus the Evil Dead TV show, it's for me it's like seeing Ash back in the you know, shop smart, even though they call it something else, obviously some sort of rights issues, but um, yeah. It's good to see him back, you know, doing what he was doing before, you know, and then all shit sort of going wrong. <laughs> yeah, I really, I really dug the TV show. I think, I think it kind of it ran for three seasons. The first two seasons were really solid. I think it kind of starts a little bit running out of steam by like the, the third season. I, yeah. I wasn't super pumped on the third season, but we're, we're, we're incredibly lucky that that show got made like at all. And I, I think if basically fans hadn't been pestering Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell for, you know, give us more evil dead. That's what we've wanted all these years. Uh, I don't think that show would have gotten made. And uh, yeah, like in the first, like you said, the first, the first two seasons I think are a great, uh, just kind of combination of things from all three movies and uh, it does kind of expand on it because obviously it's older ash and uh yeah it's 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 kind of a miracle that that thing got made and that it was as good as it was so i'm not you know super salty that it only ended up lasting three seasons i think that's probably more than anybody ever thought yeah. prior to that that we would get but uh yeah it's 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 a nice little wrap up to the uh to, to, to the series, how, how do you feel? I also watched the 2013 remake of Evil Dead yesterday. How, how do you feel about that one? Yeah, um, some mixed review. I feel a bit mixed about it. I can sort of see where they're going, but I think because I'm such a an Ash fan, I, I watch it sort of missing him, but I kind of see yeah. where they're going. So as a horror film, um, and... I, I like the way they're trying to tell the story. I think they're tr- sort of trying to sort of say it from a, someone who's dealing with drugs and issues like that, uh, which was kind of interesting. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it, it was okay. But if I'm honest with you, um, I'm the first three movies all day long. That's my honest opinion. Do you know what I mean? How about yourself? Yeah. Did, you, did you enjoy it? What was your take on it? Uh, I'm I'm kind of an, I'm kind of the same as you on that. I was I was definitely blown away by how much gore they got away with yeah. in an R-rated movie that I saw in a theater, like, with a bunch of people. That's probably one of the goriest and most, like, insanely violent movies that came out in the 2010s. Uh, other than that, like, I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of the same way. Like, I, I, I don't mind the characters 
in the remake, but I'm definitely missing Ash the whole yeah. time, and I don't think any of the characters ever really, you know, rise to how cool Ash as a character is. Like, they, they really tried, but uh, I, I think the characters are kind of the weak spot of that one. They're 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 fairly disposable and kind of one note, especially, like, their friend that's, like, the the school teacher or whatever that's, like has absolutely no motivation whatsoever to be reading from the Book of the Dead. He just does it because that's the movie that he's in and somebody's got to do it, kind yeah. of. And, like, so like the other side characters, I think, are fairly disposable and aren't really, you know, it's, it, I mean, it's an impossible task to try and be as cool as Bruce Campbell in the original Evil Dead movies. Like, you're just, just ask, you're just setting yourself up for failure even trying. So I don't think they really, I think they were kind of, trying to go in a different direction with it which uh you know that that's that's gonna be you know i i, I think bruce campbell's done with these movies uh, yeah. especially after the tv show i don't think he wants to like at some point they're going to have to pass the torch if they're gonna keep making which evidently they are there's like a tv show i think or it might be like a mini series or something coming to hbo here in the next like year or two i think it's called evil dead rise yeah. That's gonna, it's going to be kind of more like that, where like it's you know exists in the same universe kind of, but you got to figure out a way to make it interesting and cool without Bruce Campbell, which is seems like an impossible task to me. But I don't know. We'll see. I'll I'll, I'll definitely like keep checking these out if they keep making them, and if it's not good, I mean, there's also an enormous amount of comic book. Uh, versions of Evil Dead, like where they've kind of continued the story. I think like yeah. three or four different comic studios have done Evil Dead comics, and they're all, uh, you know, they're they're entertaining. They're it's a, you know it's it's kind of one of those things. If you don't like it, like you don't have to keep reading them or you know stick with it or whatever. But for the people that are just you know madly jonesing for some more Evil Dead stories and some more stuff with Ash. There's a, a whole ton of comic books out there for you. So. Yeah, I mean, I think the best way to sequel an Evil Dead film is to almost homage it the way Peter Jackson did with Brain Dead, And kind of, so then the audience kind of goes, oh, I see what you did there. You're throwing yeah. in a bit of Evil Dead, but it works because you're using a different sort of format, but you're using the same similar sort of blueprint, which is fine, and I like that. And it's the same with Edgar Wright with, um, you know, Shaun of the Dead. And, um, so I, I, I but uh, the other thing I do like is that, uh, I was going to mention this as well with Sam Raimi, I kind of liked what he did with um, uh, the Dark Man. Uh, movie, you know, it's movie, as we said before, with the sort of superhero genre of Spider-Man. I like the way that he created his own superhero, and uh, Dark Man certainly had that sort of Raimi, uh, you know, tone to it. You know, what I mean, when I watched it, I thought, oh yeah, here we go. This is the same yeah. dude that did Army of Darkness, and you know, he's he's got a um, a superhero that's come out in a time. Uh, in the 90s which I thought oh this is different because this superhero has been tortured he's been burnt and he hides in the shadows so it it, it, it was something different I thought at that time do you know what I mean I thought oh yeah it's kind of cool so, yeah yeah even even like still like after 50 million superhero movies of the last like 20 years or so Darkman is super unique It's mm. it's got kind of a a little bit of a mean streak to it and it's not afraid to like you know uh, be be fairly dark compared to you know a lot of the like Marvel stuff, which, which I love the Marvel stuff too. But yeah, like the Dark Man is uh, kind of an underappreciated gem, I think, in that respect, and how different it is from most superhero movies. Yeah, give me the fucking elephant. <laughs> 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 uh, dear. All right, Mark. Well, well. I think we'll end it on the fucking elephant from, from <laughs> Dark Man. <laughs> oh, man. Well, thank you for coming on to the show today, Mark. Um, we we had some technical issues along the way. Um, but with my, like I say, my ninja editing, I'll be able to sort that out. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, Evil Dead. Uh, for any listeners out there who haven't seen the Evil Dead, if, you, if this film has somehow bypassed you somehow in your life, Go and check it out. Go and sit down. And um, I certainly recommend it at 11 o'clock at night with lights off and some some beers or coffees or whatever you want. Some 
uh, tacos or whatever. You know, sit down, enjoy it, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> jump jump into that rabbit hole with Ash, and it will just take you to another place. So, um, yeah. So, Mark, uh, before I wrap it up, have, have you got um, any shows coming up, or you're doing the nasty with uh, Duncan? Do you want to give us a little bit of a yeah, for sure. Uh, a yeah, a new episode of Doing the Nasty just came out like about a week ago, where we covered the movie Extro, uh, oh, wow. which is an well, insane, insane up, yeah. alien oh. ripoff. It's oh. such a fucking bizarre <laughs> movie. Uh, oh. Yeah, Extro, Extro is fantastic. Mm. Uh, we, we also on that same show covered a movie called The Aftermath, which I don't think a whole lot of people are super familiar with. That's a, that's got an early Sid Haig performance as like a bad guy oh. in it it's kind of a post-apocalyptic like dudes come back from a space voyage and found the world uh in shambles kind of movie uh really really great i find there's a pretty good copy of that floating around on youtube if you check that out uh so yeah that was the last episode of doing the nasty that came out uh should be another one uh getting recorded here sometime in september i forget which movies are on it it's two movies i had not heard of so and i still have to get around to watching but uh yeah you can find those shows uh those are on the podcast under the stairs uh website along with all the other uh like side shows basically that duncan does in addition to the podcast under the stairs uh i i think if you just go i think it's t putts cast dot com is where all that stuff is at uh also on your you know usual uh, podcatcher type stuff. Uh, yeah, I've done a whole bunch of guest appearances on other people's shows. I was on with uh, Derek and Dubs over on the Cinema Attack yep. podcast not very long ago, um, where we did uh, dark fairy tale uh, summoning demon kind of movies. We talked about Pumpkinhead and Pie Wacket and. Um, Candisha, which is a newer movie that's out on Shutter right now. It's it's from the guys that directed Inside. It's uh, very very. It's kind of a weird combination of like Candyman and uh, Pumpkinhead. Uh, yeah, I had a, had a blast recording with those guys. I should be recording a new. Uh, I should be on the new episode of Kiss the Goat yeah. here pretty soon. Um, I forget. We haven't recorded that one yet. I haven't watched the movie yet for that one, so I forget which one that is. But. Uh, uh, that should be coming soon. I recorded an episode with Des over on Desmond's Flicks. Uh, yep. That should be up on YouTube here in the next like week or so. We talked about Seven and um, The Exorcist Three and Madman, right. which was a lot of fun. That, that was my first time recording with Des. And uh, also, uh, our, our our friends over there. There's a YouTube channel called The Video Nasty Project. That kind of does this. So they they went through in alphabetical order and did all the video nasties on their on their YouTube channel. So the, the, I always consider those guys kind of like our our, our sister show, basically, or maybe we're their sister show. I, I'm not really sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I did that. That was my first video podcast, basically, that I've ever done. That should be coming out early October. And we talked about the movie Censor that just came out. Uh, which is kind of about the video nasties. Also, it's it's kind of a psychological yeah. horror thing that takes place around the the video nasties. Um, I think that's that's it for the most part. Oh, there there was a I was on an episode of Darren Wilson of the Psycho Semantic Cast. Get just came out yeah. Where, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, where we talked about the Bruce McDonald movie Hardcore Logo, which is uh, kind of loosely referred to as the punk rock Spinal Tap. It's nowhere near as goofy as Spinal Tap, but it's kind of done in the same style. Uh, yeah, hard, hard Card Logo. That's a, a criminally underseen movie that I definitely recommend to anybody that's into. And when we on the episode, we kind of barely we do the same thing on every time I every time I go on Darren's show, we do the same thing where we barely talk about the movie <laughs> and instead just talk about the incredibly weird lives that both of us have lived. And that was kind of a great one because we just talked about. Uh, Darren was in a whole bunch of punk bands yeah. uh, previously and had lots of lots of fun stories about touring and uh, I, I used to hang around a lot of like punk bands too and had, had some so that was the primary focus of that show so yeah I had, I had a lot of fun doing that one that's that's also over on the the Legion podcast I think that's that's about it obviously we got the uh, we're wrapping up the summer series over on the podcast oh, yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah Duncan yeah that's uh, right yeah 
the uh, uh, the twenty twenty fifteen was the last one of those that I did, and then we've got a roundtable that we're recording sometime this month that covers like basically the whole decade or whatever. But yeah, twenty fifteen, holy shit, that was a great year for horror movies. So yeah, definitely uh, check that out. That's a four hour long podcast. Yeah. Uh, on that one and that wasn't even the longest episode in that whole series i think one of the other years was, it was like a seven hour recording on that particular year but uh yeah the the 2015 episode is the second one of those that i'm on i i was really stoked to, to rewatch a bunch of those movies so yeah definitely check all that stuff out well, i was gonna say it's all about the segues man do you know what i mean when you're talking about like joining the show uh, it's certainly all about that and uh, yeah okay then Mark well uh, like I say thanks for coming on to the show today it's been great having you here uh, finally on the bite sized cinema and a uh, great movie to talk about so um, I hope you enjoyed that guys um, before I wrap the show up I'm just going to do a little bit of admin for the show um, I'm a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network so please go and check out all the other shows shows there that Mark spoke about um you can find the Bite Size Cinema podcast on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, and several other players. If you type in Bite Size Cinema podcast into Google, it will take you to a place where you can listen to the show. I also have a Facebook page, so that's where you can contact me, uh, post anything on there that you want me to have a look at. I'll be happy to do that. Um, what's coming up next? I don't know. <laughs> I literally make this show up as I go along, so... Something will probably pop into my head when I'm driving uh, into London this week. Something will just go ping and I'll go, oh, yeah, I'll do that. So it'll be a surprise. So I will think of something to do. Um, also check out my other show, The Mystery Vault Podcast, um, which I've just done. Uh, the Max Headroom incident from the 80s, which is something I never knew about. So go and check that out if you want to listen to that. Um, so, yeah. There you go, guys. As always, keep it bite-sized, keep it safe, and be careful of those cabins in the woods because the shit can go down, people. So, I'll see you later. this show then make sure you check out the other great shows on the legion podcast network like cinema psyops cinema beef devour the podcast duncan and Bo come correct exploding heads horror movie podcast friday the 13th get slayed the hell mean power hour hello this is the doom show hero hero go show kill the cast underwater kaiju from outer space jerry hates action legion after dark metal health obsessive cinema discourse Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Witch vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.